West New Britain to address increasing multi-drug resistant TB. PNG Customs admits challenges on counterfeit goods coming into the country. And new road for coffee farmers in Eastern Highlands province. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Saturday's news. West New Britain is on full alert to address the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in the province. Chairman of the Provincial Health Authority, Dr. Matthias Sapuri, told MTV News control measures have been put in place to address immediate concerns. Dr. Sapuri says it's a matter of urgency and they have developed a five-year strategic action plan to address TB in the province. The multi-drug resistant TB has hit West New Britain province with 18 recorded cases. This has raised the alarm and the Provincial Health Authority under its strategic action plan, working around the clock to address this epidemic. In the first quarter for this year alone, West New Britain has recorded 8,885 TB cases. Our resistant TB is a, it's a big problem for, for us in Papua New Guinea. And as I said, it's a sitting time bomb and we need to take control of that now. Because if we don't, then the explosion of MDR resistant in Papua New Guinea will cause major catastrophe in mortality that relates to tuberculosis. Control measures need to be put in place. And Dr. Sapri says early detection and treatment will help to minimize the spread. So that's been our concern. Our team in Western Britain over the last 12 months uh, put in strategies in place for the immediate action plan to make sure that we do all these things to uh, ensure we get it under control. And in fact, we are only one of the only provinces that has got enough TV drugs available in the province to make sure that we treat our patients, which is good for us. West Britain has a highly mobile population with increased movement of people in and out of the province. This is post high risk to the spread of multi-drug resistant TB. The highly mobile population that gets in and out is through the seaports, through, uh, through Kimbe and Biala. That's the usual ports that they enter into the province. The West Britain Provincial Health Authority is working closely with the National Health Department for the immediate action plan. A submission has been put to Cabinet for funding to expand the TB program in the province. The Provincial Health Authority has been in discussion with the National Department regularly over the last few months. Uh, we are fortunate that uh, uh, our discussions has come into setting up some timelines. So we are working very closely with the National Department of Health TB program team, which is headed by Dr. Bieb and Dr. Aya and uh, Dr. Dakulala, all working under the command of our secretary, uh, Mr. Kassin. Uh, they are now going to be moving to Western Britain at the end of this month to work with our team at the, uh, on, on site. Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV News. Meanwhile, surveillance, monitoring and detection have been scaled up to control TB in the province. Chairman of the Provincial Health Authority, Dr. Matthias Sapuri, says that while the multi-drug resistant TB may become an issue for the PNG Games, it should not impact these largest sporting events. While the countdown begins for the PNG Games hosted by West New Britain, TB may be an issue of concern for teams consisting of athletes and officials. However, Chairman of the West New Britain Provincial Health Authority says people should not be afraid because TB is under control. And because we're scaling up our surveillance and monitoring and detection in the province, you're more likely to see someone have a diagnosis made, make sure that you're either cleared or if you're positive, you get treated. Dr. Sapuri says all suspected TB patients will have to be brought in for medical examination to help minimize risk. Patients who have this sort of symptom that likely put them to be in the category of MDT, uh, MDR resistance, they must get immediate attention to our doctors and the Kimber General Hospital. We've got a good team of physicians and pediatricians and specialists working together on the ground. And uh, we hope that uh, once everything is in order, we'll get things under control in the next few months. So uh, my message to the people who go going to the game is don't, don't, don't fear tuberculosis in Western Britain. Patients who will be diagnosed with multi-drug resistant TB will be admitted to the hospital in a specialized ward for treatment. 
But if you potentially got a very dangerous uh, type of TB, which is the MDR, then you will be isolated, kept in the hospital. We have a specialized ward in Kimber General Hospital for MDR patients now, and we are able to keep them isolated, treat them, and it's a long-term treatment. It's not just the usual six months that you get for tuberculosis treatment. Uh, this can go as long as 18 months of treatment. Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV News. PNG Customs Chief Commissioner admits there are real challenges faced when it comes to smuggling of counterfeit and other illegal products. Mr. Paul says monitoring and surveillance on borders are weak and they're trying to eradicate the act. For now, they're profiling people and imports. You know, PNG Customs Chief Commissioner Ray Paul says the department is currently working with other departments like health, commerce and industry and others to have a fixed standard in place. Once the standard is in place, people will have to import according to the standards. Mr. Paul explains unless the standards are in place, they can be able to control counterfeit and other illegal products coming into the country. Unfortunately for Medang, we suppose uh, that there's supposed to be a thing like most be placed here, but we are not putting one here, but we are working one in lay. And when that comes in in about 2019, that's what we are predicting and projecting, then we could be able to control that. But all in all, uh, we have the issue of standards that we are working on. Unless we have standards, then we can be able, okay, we can be able to control this. Because for now, anybody can import anything. The Unless other issue is place, the illegal products. These are contraband goods, illicit trade and others. These are goods that are prohibited from coming into the country. This means that you have to get proper clearance first from responsible authorities and regulators. The Chief Commissioner warns against bringing in these prohibited products, saying his department will still be able to catch persons engaged in this. It's not too long that we will catch up with anyone who we'll continue to import things that are not right. And we're counting on what we have in stock. In time, we will catch you. You can go for the first good 10 of imports, but the next 10 after that would be a big challenge because it won't be that easy. Mr. Paul we'll says the amount of workload is enormous compared to the number of officers, and it is also a challenge for the department. But to counter that, officers must be able to be working smartly and being smart in their approach. We have a big challenge on hand. From our side, it's about working smart now and being smart in our approach. Like I said, we cannot stop every containers, every person that crosses the border. No, we can't. We will have to go by profiling them and targeting. Then only we will get what we want to get. There will be more coming in. That's why we call on people. Huh? People out there, public, to help us do our business. Martha Lewis, National MTV News, Medang. Coffee farmers of Obura Wanenara District in Eastern Highlands Province have all the reasons to smile. After years of struggle, they will be connected through a new road access. This new feeder road will link farmers of that rich coffee producing area to the main national roads to access main markets. Central Supply and Tenders Board and World Bank have sealed off this new project at the cost of 1.7 million kina. Five kilometers of the Nompia Bibiori Road project covers around four to 5,000 people in this rich coffee producing areas. Yesterday, contractual agreements were signed to mark the beginning of this significant project. It has taken us a bit of time, but uh, again, I've said that we have to get the process correct. The Central Supply Tenders Board is, uh, is going a, a long way to make sure that the process that we put in place are uh, uh, foolproof, uh, making sure that they're transparent. Once we empower people in the rural areas, once they get engaged in coffee production, then uh, they would have, uh, they would disengage from doing other things that brings about social ills. This is a partnership program between the Obra Wadindara District Development Authority and the Coffee Industry Corporation under the Productive Partnership in Agriculture Project Coffee Component. It's funded by World Bank, which looks into farmers' transport accessibility 
and market infrastructure access. And this is one of the funding that is made available to CIC and uh, the Oborowana District uh, Partnership Program to assist our coffee farmers to uh, allow their coffee products to be taken to the markets uh, for uh, development of the microeconomy within the locality. This will greatly help our farmers who produce some of the best coffee in Eastern Islands at, uh, at the back of Tairona to have easier access to get their product, the coffee, into the market. But in doing so, it's not only the coffee, we also help the other sectors as well. They help the education and the, the accessibility for our people to uh, have easier access to the market. This is the first ever road project outside of Eastern Highlands, which Kasampi Construction Limited has undertaken. Under the company's logo, Satisfaction for All, General Manager Pius Pekirofa says they're happy to deliver this project in the time frame of six months. So you must work in something where all the time you can have mass now. Country blow me, district blow me, province blow me, it can develop. And there's like a big point blow here. Thank you, through uh, all MTV team, we have mass. We play like this little top blow me. Thank you, through. We took the whole day, we took them through the um, process of evaluation so they could see how transparent it is and how tedious the process is. Fabian Hacklitz, National MTV News. Mount Hagen's Kagamuga International Airport will undergo a major facelift as part of the Airport Infrastructure Development Program of the National Airports Corporation. Acting Managing Director Richard Yopo says continuous work on this airport is to meet international standards and provide efficient services for the travelling public. Kagamuga International Airport in Western Highlands Province is one of the national airports in Papua New Guinea. In 2015, a new terminal was built and officially opened. Yesterday's contractual signing in Port Mosby was for the aircraft, pavement strengthening or runway extension, new air traffic control tower building and others. Contractor from India, ESA, has won the bid for this project, valued at over 100 million kina. That uh, uh, we get a uh, for money, and uh, uh, the project is delivered on time. That's the expectation of the country and the people of this country. The Mount Hagen project will be facilitated by the National Airport Corporation CADU program. It's a joint funding arrangement between the government of Papua New Guinea and the Asian Development Bank. Fabian Hakalitz, National MTV News. Another six election petitions went through the Court of Disputed Returns at the Waigani National Court in Port Moresby. Justice Colin McCall yesterday presided over the motion hearings of former Tewai CRC MP Mao Zeming against the Electoral Commission and pre-trial conference for losing SALA candidate Glenn Tobewa against sitting MP David Stephen. Of the six, four are pre-trial conferences while the other two motion hearings. Among stories, when we come back, students accelerate business skills. Don't go away. Welcome back. The National Fisheries Authority has paid its dividend of 60 million kina to the national government. This payment now makes NFA's total dividend payment 120 million kina and they will pay the remaining 30 million kina at the end of this year. Chief Secretary Isaac Lupari says the funds will be catered for in a useful way, covering government services such as health and education. NCSL has changed its approach and way of conducting business, especially when dealing with employers. They have introduced employer visits and awareness to keep members informed about their products and services. Awareness is vital in keeping members informed. NCSL has introduced this concept of employee visits to educate and keep members informed with the products and services. A recent employee visit was in Medang. NCSL officer Geraldine Lokine visited staff of Brian Bell who were not members but wanted to know more about the products, services and beneficiaries. The presentations provided existing and prospective members 
a chance to know more about the society and its offerings. She said most were interested to know more about the 1% monthly loan interest charged on a member's loan and how to obtain discounts under NCSL's Value Back Loyalty Program. She said NCSL aims to improve the quality of its members' lives through security, returns, services and product range. Fabian Hacklitz, National MTV News. Students of Tokarara and Jubilee Secondary Schools in Port Moresby were proud recipients of the first ever pilot entrepreneurship program for high school students facilitated by the Kumul Foundation Inc. The program aims to accelerate students' potential in reaching excellence by acquiring skills and experience in collaborative leadership, financial and business management as they learn to set up their micro-businesses and earn revenue. Students were able to define their own future during the entrepreneurship program. The program aims to start up entrepreneurship mindset of the next generation of emerging businessmen and women. We thought that it's important that we do an intensive program with the students so they really know uh, some fundamentals, what's really important in seeing the success of their startups. And two really important things that stand out would be identifying opportunities and also communication in the groups. Teacher Janet Sengi believes it will add significant value to students to acquire real skills, confidence and experience to accelerate them in reaching their potential in the classroom. Uh, here we are encouraging young, young people and young uh, students at a very early age to change their mindset and encourage them to think uh, business at an early, early stage because not everyone is given an opportunity to go on to a uh, Tessary institutions, so this kind of programs help the kids to also prepare themselves. And We're doing a lot of reflection. There's a lot of reflection that um, went on with the activities. One was really looking at how they communicate and how in the groups, because they'll be working in teams for the, for the term, although they have all the bright ideas and they'd like to go forward, many times communication problems in the group can bring the group down. Students came up with significant numbers of new business ideas in their practical activities which they could easily implement in their community startup groups. Ways to overcome risk, ideas and opinions must be shared in order for the company to run smoothly. Student Rachel Hanu says it's important to learn now then later when it's too late. The overall program itself is really empowering. I think it's really good for young minds like us. So, yeah, build, it's building our characters and personality and most of all our values. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Over 20,000 grade 12 students in the country have completed the first five days of their national examination on Friday. The exams began on Monday this week and will end next Wednesday, October 25th. In Port Moresby, students from at least 10 secondary schools set these exams, although there were minor disturbances when PMV operators went on strike. Members of the lay public were treated to a taste of homegrown talents when artist Clem and Coys did a live painting in the center of town. Coys never studied art, but his talents have taken him all over the country. His work today was titled Kumul Blumarbe, which he painted in front of a small audience. For this self-taught symbol artist, any challenge related to his passion of painting is worth doing. So last week we asked him to do a live painting in the center of town, a challenge he readily accepted. This morning he set up in front of the telecom building a blank canvas on a plywood, brushes and paints. The sketch began at 10 a.m. Initially he called the painting Asa Sumba, then changed it to Kumul Blomorobe. Almost always, Clement starts with a background of bold colors as the foundation for the details that come later. Kumul Blomorobe is his own interpretation of the Morobe province flag, which has the Kumul, a kundu, spears and three colors. Expression of Milo, paint me, put in my battle paradise, or some other Morobe flag at battle paradise, kundu drum. The audience was initially very small, then the crowd grew as the colors were painted and the shape of the kumul became more recognizable. Number one, three. By 11.30, much of the bird was painted, then the real artistry and the details began. 
The Kumul's plumes have a blend of brown, yellow and black. Any slight miscalculation of those colors can easily change the painting. But for Clement Kois, master of colors as his friends call him, too easy. By 12 p.m. the painting was completed. A buyer arrived, Jacob Kauper, the managing director of the Pacific Corporate Security Services, paid for the painting and took possession of it. This is a countryman. I'm very impressed with the work that he did. And uh, I think uh, most of us would take it for granted, you know. But it requires someone to spend some time and his all of his ability and what to arrive at doing what he did. Kaupa says artists like Clement have to be supported and he was quite pleased with the talent. I would like to encourage others to come out as well and support because you're looking at this uh, sort of product here, they've been selling them in the hotels and into places that, you know, people still like it. So I think uh, they need uh, some sort of promotions and advertising of the activities. Scott Wade, National MTV News, Lay. Two weeks after the graduation of PNG students of the Australia Pacific Technical College, Vanuatu also graduated 98 of their students. The graduation held in Port Vila was attended by Prime Minister Charlotte Salwai Tabi Masmas, who commended the graduates for their hard work in advancing their careers through APTC. 18 pioneer students graduated with Certificate 3 in Education Support designed to upskill teaching aids and training assistance to support and boost inclusive education. The program supports the objective of the Education Ministry and Training to mainstream inclusive education across all teaching service sectors by 2020. Deputy Police Commissioner and Chief of Operations Jim Andrews says tra traffic police are not performing their duties well to minimize the increasing number of unregistered vehicles in Port Moresby. Andrews said there are many mechanical defective motor vehicles driven around in Port Moresby, especially after 6 p.m. He made these remarks at a briefing with the directri directorate concerned and demanded that traffic police shape up and clamp down on the high rate of abuse of traffic rules. Andrew's comments come days after PMV operators in Port Moresby went on strike after the alleged assault of an operator last Monday. Meanwhile, it has become a norm for PMV operators not completing their routes or change charge extra fees, especially in the afternoons. And to some entertainment news, it's not every day international artists perform for free in front of an audience, but today was one of those days. International urban pop group Justice Crew rocked the crowded Vision City Mega Mall today. They are in the country as brand ambassadors for emerging 4G smartphone brand Mint as part of the company's global campaign. This was the scene today at the Vision City Mega Mall. Despite the scorching heat, it was an energetic concert, turning the mall's car park into a concert ground with a full-on performance by the urban pop group. Although they performed only twice, they left the fans wanting more. <laughs> The dance crew will be performing again tonight at the Lamana Gold Club and also guest judge for a dance competition. Tomorrow they will be having a bigger concert at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium following the Mint Carlo Walk for Life event. Merlin Diakotam, National MTV News. After these short messages, stories making headlines overseas. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas around the world, journalists are coming under fire like never before with daily attacks putting their lives at risk. A well-known investigative journalist of Malta, an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, the EU's smallest member state, Daphne Caruana Galizia, was assassinated, killed by a car bomb when she drove away from her house on Monday. She was a popular and widely read blogger and a relentless investigator, digging deep into allegations of corruption by 
by Malta's political circle in both the opposition and the ruling party, even alleging the Prime Minister and his wife had hidden offshore bank accounts, which they strongly denied. As the nation mourns her death, Prime Minister Joseph Muscat says such barbaric acts are not tolerated. We are living in a free world. That's something that we always tolerated in the sense that it's obviously her right to, to write these things. It's obviously my right to protect myself if I feel uh, aggrieved in court. And that's how it always happened. This is why this is shocking for us, because this, this is simply not on. There will be absolutely no impunity for anyone. This is a country where rule of law reigns uh, supreme. And I will make sure that um, justice is done and there will be absolutely no impunity for anyone, be it from any part of the political spectrum, if there is politics involved in this, or from any other sector. New Zealand's new Prime Minister-elect Jacinda Ardern has got straight down to business 24 hours after claiming the top job. Ms. Ardern has already begun to outline her foreign policy agenda, saying she intends to discuss the growing number of people being deported back to New Zealand on character grounds despite them living most of their lives in Australia. She'll discuss that when she meets Malcolm Turnbull soon. When it comes to uh, foreign diplomacy, she says that uh, once she forms government, one of her main priorities is coming over to Australia to visit. She wants to meet face-to-face uh, -face with the Prime Minister. Now, she said that that uh, diplomatic hiccup with Julie Bishop a couple of weeks ago is water under the bridge. Now, Jacinda Ardern has said that she wants to form closer ties with Australia, but she has a few concerns that she wants to raise with the Prime Minister. Now, that includes some of those New Zealanders uh, being deported out of Australia despite living most of their lives there. That comes after the deportation on character grounds. And she's also pledged retaliation if New Zealand students in tertiary education in Australia end up paying more for their uh, education as the Australian government has flagged. So a couple of issues there on foreign diplomacy, but she's still got to work out who is who in her cabinet. Well, look, it was 80 days between when Jacinda Ardern was elevated to Labor leader to when she actually formed government this week. So it's been a, a very quick roller coaster ride for her. Now she's got to deal with the three parties in her cabinet. So the easy work um, has happened. Now the hard work begins. Of course, you've got the Green Party and New Zealand First. They're, in the past, they've been ideologically opposed. And then she's also facing a huge opposition. This is the the first time that a party has won the majority of seats but didn't form government. Uh, so there's, it's just a, a razor wire opposition, uh, majority between the opposition and the government. She's got to hold all of this together throughout the term and push ahead with her policies. Firstly, Jacinda Ardern has promised a progressive change for New Zealand. Now, um, one of those policies that is likely to be uh, pushed ahead will be one of the Greens policies, a referendum on personal use of cannabis that Labor has said it's not opposed to. So that's likely to happen. The exact timing of when, though, will be up to the Cabinet. Now, another matter that uh, Labor and New Zealand first uh, have decided is a good idea is to cut immigration. There could be cuts of up to 30,000 people a year. Uh, that's one of the main platforms that Winston Peters has said was responsible for some of the economic problems here. Now, earlier on uh, in the week when Winston Peters gave his address, he flagged that New Zealand could be facing an economic slowdown in the coming years and was warning the country to brace for it. But he also added that he's confident that the policies that they'll be pulling together over the next few months will be enough uh, to keep the economy ticking over here. A new exhibit celebrating the 20th anniversary of the first Harry Potter book features some rare memorable events along with some historic artifacts in the popular series. The boy who lived, Voldemort, and Quidditch began 20 years ago when J.K. Rowling enthralled the world with the release of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. On the two-decade anniversary, the British Library has conjured to life Rowling's magical world in a new exhibition. 
This exhibition obviously will draw on a lot of things that, that, that great fans of Harry Potter will know and love. Things like bizarre stones, won't need any explanation to them, mandrake roots, all the Philosopher's Stone. Visitors can mix potions, study divination, or look into the swirling depths of the crystal ball, brought to life by Google Arts and culture. But perhaps the biggest selling point, a rare chance to view J.K. Rowling's own drafts and sketches for the first time ever. They range from some of her early sketches of some of the characters in the Harry Potter stories. I think it's fascinating to actually see how the author views her own characters, alongside which we have some of her notes, for example, her plans for writing the fifth book in the series, The Order of the Phoenix. The scratched out scrawled pages are a window into Rowling's mind as she began writing some of the best selling books of all time. But the offerings aren't limited to Potter fanatics. Regular muggles can also revel in a treasure trove of wizardry artifacts. But for those of you who aren't you know, a big fan of Harry Potter who might not even have read the books. You, you still, I think, get a lot out of this exhibition because it does explore ideas relating to early magic, to early science and belief. An 800 BC cauldron retrieved from the River Thames, medieval illustrations of witches, Chinese oracle bones thousands of years old, or a 15th century tombstone of Nicholas Flamel a posthumously reputed alchemist who supposedly discovered immortality. So one of my favorite items has to be this, the, the Ripley scroll, which is just under six meters long, full of really strange, unusual alchemical Im imagery telling you how to make the Philosopher's Stone. And people were, were working on this for, for, for centuries to try and create what is the elixir of eternal life. Perhaps it's no accident the British Library is a short walk from King's Cross Station where witches and wizards can hop off at platform nine and three quarters. U.S. President Donald Trump's call to grieving families persists. So to the questions of what led to the death of four soldiers in an ambush in Nigger this month. On Friday, things got worse for him and his staff because it was hard for them to find their way back. President's response to a U.S. soldier killed in Niger, devolving into a political brawl. Trump taking to Twitter again to blast the congresswoman who accused him of being insensitive in a condolence call when he told Maisha Johnson, the widow of Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, that her husband knew what he got into when he signed up to serve. The fake news is going crazy with wacky Congresswoman Wilson, who was secretly on a very personal call and gave a total lie on content, Trump tweeted. What began as a question over an ambush in Niger that left four American soldiers dead, now morphing into a political battle over how the commander-in-chief carries out his most solemn duty, comforting the families of soldiers who have made the ultimate sacrifice. White House Chief of Staff and retired Marine General John Kelly made a rare appearance in the briefing room. A gold star father himself, he lamented that a call between the commander-in-chief and the widow of a fallen soldier was being politicized. It stuns me that a member of Congress would have listened in on that conversation. Absolutely stuns me. And I thought at least that was sacred. Wilson says she's close with the family and was with them when the president called. But Kelly went further in his criticism Thursday, taking another swipe at the congresswoman. And a congresswoman uh, stood up and in the long tradition of empty barrels making the most noise, stood up there and all of that and talked about how she was instrumental in getting the funding for that building and how she took care of her constituents because she got the money and she just called up President Obama and on that phone call he gave the money, the twenty million dollars to build the building. And she sat down and we were stunned, stunned that she'd done it. Even for someone that is that empty a barrel? We were stunned. Wilson quickly took issue with how the chief of staff portrayed her appearance at the FBI building dedication. I was not even in Congress in 2009 when the money for the building was secured. So that's a lie. How dare he? However, I named the building uh, at the behest of Director Comey with the help of Speaker Boehner working across party lines. So he didn't tell the truth.
and he needs to stop telling lies on me. A video of the 2015 dedication from the Sun Sentinel doesn't back up Kelly's version of events. While the congresswoman touts her efforts in getting the building named for the fallen FBI agents, there's no discussion of securing funding for the project. Everyone said that's impossible. It takes at least eight months to a year to complete the process through the House, the Senate, and to the President's office. I said, I'm a school principal. <laughs> and I said... True Guy Sports is next. Stick around for that. Two Kai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. To rugby, the Earl Search PNG Orchids outmatched the Mayor's Inter Invitational side 30 points to 6 in an International Rugby League exhibition match in Calendar Park, Queensland, Australia. Orchids stamped their authority in the first half, racing away with two tries courtesy of Joan Kuman. Backing up from a 14 to 6 scoreline at halftime, PNG proved too strong in the second stanza, keeping the girls from far north Queensland scoreless. PNG won by a comfortable 30 points to 6. The term dead rubber has become drearily familiar for Australian rugby fans at the tail end of a Bladislaw Cup series. The Wallabies' desperation for any kind of win over the All Blacks should ensure a spirited clash in Brisbane tonight. Both teams trained in Brisbane yesterday ahead of tonight's match. The All Blacks have battled a mounting injury toll, forcing coach Steve Hansen to mix and match across the team sheet. The backups have performed well, helping the side to six straight wins in the rugby championship. By contrast, the Wallabies have been in a real state of harmony. They will be motivated to give former captain Stephen Moore a good send-off in front of a home crowd. Yeah, it'd be great to beat the number one team in the world, you know. Um, I think that would uh, do a lot of things for a lot of people and maybe change their perception. But we're, we're, very, um, we're very positive of how things have been working in and around the team and the guys' commitment to the detail and commitment to getting better. And tomorrow night's just going to be a reflection of that. A rare win over the Old Blacks would completely change the complexion of a mostly gloomy year for Australian rugby in which none of the country's five Super League teams managed a win over New Zealand opponents throughout the entire season. Um, I guess you know, the combinations are you know, a lot more s smoother. Uh, you know, you're you used to each other, you're playing with each other a lot, and uh, it tends to correlate to better performances, and, and we've seen that. Um, and so we've got a, yeah, a big threat from them. They're, they're looking good. Um, but for us, we've got to focus on ourselves. You know, we've had a great prep this week. It's uh, very nice over here in Brizzy, and uh, looking forward to it putting on our, on our performance tomorrow. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. More in Chukai Sports when we come back. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. Ben Gardner is the new Kiwis assistant coach following the late withdrawal of Garth Brennan. Gardner has recent success as assistant coach of the New South Wales under-20 sides and had fortunes with the North Sydney Bears. Kiwis coach David Kidwell welcomed Gardner into the Kiwis camp and said his experience will bring a real focus on the team's defence. Gardner is looking forward to learn more about the New Zealand culture and help guide the Kiwis through 2017 Rugby League World Cup. California's Alex Mason made their crossing between Lebanon's Rock of Rushi pillars recently on a slake line 40 meters above the sea. Alex Mason has been an American slake, slake line at watch in a field dominated by most Europeans. The slake line is less taut than a tightrope and so more likely to swing in the wind. A fall into the water 40 meters is likely to result in death or injury, so Mason wore a safety harness for the crossing. The Rock of Rochi, or Pigeon Rock, is a rock structure in the sea, near Beirut consisting of a main rock with natural archway in it and a subsidiary rock. Mason strung the line between the two rocks and walked across it. 
Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. And that's a wrap for Trukai Sports. Up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight in the southern region, showers in Port Moresby, Alotau and Popandeta and rain periods in Daru and Kerama. In the Mumase region, showers in Dle and Wau and most, mostly fine weather in Medang, Wiwek and Fanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, fine weather expected in all centres. And in the Highlands region, morning fog in all centres. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Before we go, a quick look at our stories making headlines. West New Britain to address increasing multi-drug resistant TB in the province. PNG Customs admits challenges on counterfeit goods coming into the country and new road for coffee farmers in Eastern Highlands Province. And that's the news this Saturday, the 21st of October 2017. From the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.